Good morning and welcome to the webinar. Today's topic is activities that enhance engagement in dementia care. Thank you for joining us today. These complimentary webinars are brought to you through a collaboration of sponsorship with O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choices, Hospice and Palliative Services, Caring Companions at Home, as well as, as, well as Alzheimer's Orange County. My name is Lauren Weiss. I am the Education Coordinator here at Alzheimer's Orange County, and I will be your host today. Our sponsors are providing these webinars to you as a service to the community on topics that are beneficial for anyone who cares for and works with older adults. We hope you find today's presentation informative and useful. Today, our, presenta our presenter is going to be Kim Bailey. Kim Bailey is a gerontologist and has worked in the field as a lecturer and healthcare professional for over 30 years. She is the program and education specialist with Alzheimer's Orange County where she coordinates the early memory loss and connect to culture programs and provides educational instruction for families, clinical staff, and the greater community. As a former adjunct faculty professor, Ms. Bailey taught at California State University of Fullerton and Vanguard University. She has also served as a corporate gerontologist for the Hartford Insurance Group, Director of Community Relations and Development for the UC Irvine Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, and Consultant for Alzheimer's Care Associates and Principal for Care Management for Older Adults. Ms. Bailey is dedicated to serving the needs of our older adult community and is passionate about assisting individuals and families affected by memory loss. She holds a Master's of Science degree in Gerontology and a BA in Sociology with a minor in Human Services, both from California State University Fullerton. Okay, and I will hand it off to Kim. Well, hi everyone and Lauren, thanks for that introduction. I'm so happy to be here today as a speaker. Uh, many of you know my typical role is that of monitor, so I get an opportunity uh, to share in a different way with you today. And so that makes me happy. And we're talking about activities and engagement in dementia care. And our objectives are, uh, well, first I'll do a quick overview of dementia, specifically how it affects our ability to connect with persons with dementia. I want to go over, uh, well, it says several strat strategies, but I really wanna focus on person-centered today. Uh, the Best Friends Approach by David Troxell will be covered by David Troxell in a separate webinar on July 24th. So everyone mark your calendars for that. Uh, and then the Montessori method, you can check that out on your own. That's another method that um, has a lot of value, but we're really going to stick with person center today. I want to talk about the concept of contented involvement. I want to go over different types of examples of activities uh, that are successful or failure free. And I'll talk about the concept, concept of right sizing activities for people as they progress through the disease. So first of all, how does dementia challenge our ability to connect with others? So this is a quote, and I think it's quite powerful. It's by um, someone that we here at ALS OC have a lot of respect for, that's Dr. Al Power. He has worked uh, uh, nationally uh, doing training for care communities, and he's written several books, including Dementia Beyond Disease and Dementia Beyond Drugs. And he says, our societal view that people with cognitive changes cannot learn and grow cannot care for others and cannot give meaningful input and do not have a useful role in society, all of those stereotypes blind us to meaningful ways in which to engage folks with dementia. So, um, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot is that yes, dementia is, or Alzheimer's and other dementias are diseases that uh, ultimately lead to multiple losses, uh, horrific losses. We cannot lose sight of the person that remains. The heart and soul of that person stays intact throughout the disease, their long-term memory, their core values, etc. So we need to look at them in a different way. They're not just residents or patients, uh, you know, that uh, 
are at end of life experiencing dementia. They are people that we need to really uh, find ways to connect with and make them feel productive and a part of life and a part of living still. So, um, you know, many of you are experts in dementia and have been for many years, but we always have new folks on the webinar as well. So I just want to quickly explain that dementia is an umbrella term. It's not a disease in and of itself, but it's a collection of symptoms. It describes a variety of progressive terminal brain impairments that affect memory, thinking, judgment, and really the ability to take care of oneself. So these brain changes are gradual and take place over a, a period of years and they slowly but surely erode the person's perceptions and limit their impulse control. Uh, they cause personality changes and all kinds of havoc. Um, their interpretation of the environment and how others approach them is changing over time. And a person may lose interest as a result in things they once enjoyed, or perhaps they simply are having difficulty initiating an activity. So let me go back to this third bullet point for a moment. And I wanna say that one of the things we know about dementia is we can't change the people. We can't change the fact that they're on this trajectory, but we can change our own approach and we can change the environment. So keep those two things in mind uh, as we look at activities and, and, uh, and their place in the lives of people with dementia. And then also remember bullet four, a lot of times they've just lost their starter button. And so it's not that they can't do things, it's that they need help getting started. So we can use prompts and cues and we can help to get people started and then they have uh, you know, the ability to persevere. So keep in mind repetitive activities where they can do you know, same motion over and over again. They can often be very successful in that vein. So our goal is to connect with people and to engage them in activities, engage them in living. When we have a disconnect, we can see all of the things you see on the screen and more. We see sadness, agitation, um, problems with sundowning, wandering, uh, boredom, restlessness, etc. So really, this whole discussion of activities is key. So let's get right into the person-centered approach. So what this means, uh, and for many of you, you've been doing this for a very long time and are already incorporating these concepts, but for anyone who's new, and even if you need a refresher, we want to plan activities and conduct them around the life history, personal preferences, needs, and interests of that individual. Okay, so we need to know our residents. And if you're family members, you're already ahead of the game because you've got that life history and you know these personal preferences, et cetera. But for our friends who are working in care communities and home care and hospice and other, other places, then this is something we need to gather this information. So, um, and we need to keep in mind that activities you know, the outcomes that we're looking for, comfort, um, a feeling of belonging. They should have a purpose. They might map to the person's occupation um, and they promote a sense of identity. So these are lofty goals, but we can make it happen. We have that ability. We really do. Um, when we take into account what we know about our each individual's past, their life work, et cetera, their family, do they have a nickname, all of those things. We can use it to plan activities that matter. So um, yeah, this is what we're looking for. And you know, in a lot of care communities, I think they collect this information initially 
from the family. But my concern is that it doesn't always get translated to the direct care workers. And so we've got to find a way to do that. We, we need to know these residents. I want to give you a quick example that many of you have probably heard You've probably heard this story before, but I was doing some uh, observing in a care community uh, a while back, and I noticed that during lunch, uh, staff was busy, and there was a resident who kept coming into the kitchen, and uh, they kept redirecting her back out to just sit in a chair and wait, and she really started getting agitated, and so I looked in her file, and I found out that she used to own a restaurant. That was her life work. She had worked, she had owned, I think it was like an Arby's or something, but uh, she was in the restaurant business. So I said, let's give her an activity. And uh, even though she was very impaired, um, you know, I didn't want to involve her in cooking or anything, but I gave her a stack of pla placemats and asked her to set the placemats out. And, you know, next thing you know, she was out there and she was very happy. She felt engaged. She felt this uh, uh, type of connectedness. Um, I was just looking for a different slide. I don't see it. She felt like part of the team. And so that was a powerful connection and it was really easy to make that happen because I had the secret sauce, meaning I knew what she had done for her for a living. So all of these things are very important. Use what you know about each resident or each person or your family member to foster connection through a meaningful one on one or group activity. Use this approach all the time. And I would have, you know, on hand, just top of mind, like a set of examples that are unique to each individual. So ultimately, what does it look like? Well, we had, um, this was a number of years ago, but there was a, Photo, photo journalist who went around the world taking pictures that served as examples of person-centered care. And um, I've only included a couple of them in this presentation because of our, you know, our lack of time. But I love this one. This is in India. It's in a day center. And the woman is standing at the blackboard. They brought that blackboard in for her because they found out that she was a well-known mathematician. And so she was agitated until they discovered that they could bring in a person-centered activity. And they had her you know, go to the board and work on uh, calculations and formulas. And she did that very happily and that kept her occupied. It was something that made her feel productive and it worked very well to um, decrease her agitation. So when you apply this uh, method, you will find that it respects the person's dignity and sense of self, uh, gives people a sense of purpose, it makes them feel needed, it provides opportunities to connect and socialize with others. And importantly, it redirects them away from behavioral expressions, negative behavioral expressions. So when we see folks who are starting to get restless or agitated, we want to come in and we want to mitigate that we want to intervene with that possible behavior by presenting them with a meaningful activity that we know they enjoy that will bring them back to you know a, a, a state of equilibrium. So yeah, so look at look at this picture again. I think you could really look at that and see that this person is now engaged in something that makes her feel dignified and that really gives her a sense of purpose. And uh, she's definitely not 
exhibiting any negative behavioral expressions because she's occupied doing her life's work. Alrighty, so along these same lines, I want to talk about a great concept called contented involvement. And if you think about um, the the example I always give is sort of like, remember when you were young, we had those teeter totters on the playground. If you're of a certain age. Okay, so the two enemies of dementia are overstimulation and understimulation. So both can produce negative effects. So we're looking for a balance here. And so contented involvement is nothing more than a, a state of being, a state of well-being during which a person with dementia is occupied and engaged. Um, it, it puts them into the zone between over and under stimulation. So if you have a family member, you know, you might just write down on a post-it the top three things that they like to do, three simple activities. And we're going to give you some examples of different activities. But, um, you know, when you see a person either getting too bored or maybe getting overstimulated, you want to smoothly intervene with a, a beloved activity. And this works in the home environment and it works in, in all the other care settings as well. So you wanna produce the look like the image you see where the woman is smiling and happy. And what kind of strikes me about this photo is it reminds me of a client that I was, I was actually a personal caregiver for a client for six years. I took her through the whole disease from diagnosis all the way to her, till her pat, to her passing. So one of her favorite activities, believe it or not, was just looking out the window. <laughs> it turns out that she didn't have a lot of hobbies or interests, according to her family. Um, but one thing that she was, was nosy. <laughs> she liked looking out the window and commenting on, oh, Mrs. Jones, you know, just got another delivery. I wonder what she's doing over there. I mean, she was just sort of up on everything that was going on in the neighborhood. And so even deep into her disease, she enjoyed looking out the window. And, you know, because I was this professional, right, I just couldn't let it be. I thought that wasn't enough of an activity. So I put some bird houses out there and I put some wind chimes. Well, they ended up annoying her and I ended up taking them down and just leaving her alone because honestly, what she enjoyed was just watching people passing by and she'd talk about the birds and, you know, everything she was seeing. So that's what a state of contented involvement looks like. And it doesn't have to be high activity. It can be something uh, very simple yet pleasurable. And here's some examples. So, and I think I used most of these for her. Um, I had, she had all these photos and I found her wedding pictures and I put them into a little book. So if she was starting to get restless or, you know, getting upset for some reason or another, I would hand her one of those books. She could start to look through photos um, you know, we would have, you know, we would have coffee together. Um, but what she really enjoyed, and this is person centered, trust me, was a cocktail before dinner. It had been her habit all of her life. And so in the beginning, when she was still early stage with her, um, kids permission, I would serve her a mild, uh, you know, just a light drink and make some hors d'oeuvres. Uh, and she loved it. And then as time went on, I would serve her what I called a mocktail, which was non-alcoholic, but it's really about the ritual, you know, so this little happy hour, again, it spoke to her history because she and her husband had always done that after work. And, uh, it was a very pleasant time for us, uh, until she started getting into sundowning. And that's, that's another story. But again, photo albums, having a beverage, sitting in a chair and looking outside, as I described, holding a familiar object, 
music, listening to music. Look at the expression uh, in this on the, the face of this person in this image. Just absolutely contented involvement all the way. Listening to music that they enjoy from their background, not your favorite music, but it's their music. Uh, so maybe a headset and iPod, you know, are, might be a good idea. Um, taking a walk, holding hands. Again, simple but tried and true activities. And remember what I said in the beginning, it's about our approach and sometimes our approach isn't working. So this is another picture from that same group of pictures taken by that photojournalist. This is a man who is living in a care community in Japan and he refused to come out of his room and they would open his knock on his door and open it and they'd say come out we're having singing come out we're having an activity and he would not come out so they discovered that in his past his favorite activity was dancing and so you know they literally danced him out of his room every time they wanted him to join in for an activity and he was very as you can see from the picture he was very happy to do that so we have to adapt our approach to really encourage people to want to engage with us and i know in previous seminars and webinars we've talked a lot about facing front uh, facing them you know and and making eye contact and not getting too close but um you know, speaking softly and clearly, um, you know, using gentle touch, you know, all of that approach is really important. The right body language, the right tone, the right volume, all those things that we can do to build trust um, and engagement with our loved ones and residents. The best friends approach, just quickly, um, it just suggests that what a person with dementia needs more than anything is not a paid caregiver, but a best friend. Uh, and so when we see, and this is for the professionals on, on the line with us, when we see professionals functioning more as friends, and using that approach, people feel more safe and secure and valued. And so, again, I'd love for you to mark your, excuse me, mark your calendars for July 24th for a very special webinar by David Troxell on the um, highly valued best friends approach. Okay. Right sizing is a term that means that as people are progressing through the disease, we need to continually adapt and simplify activities. So we don't wanna take anything away from people. When we know, we know them well, we're using a person-centered approach. We know, uh, I'm gonna use a really kind of different example. We, we had a woman that we were working with here uh, a few years back and she was a horse person she loved horses so you know this i kind of watched this through the whole progression of the disease the family at first you know she was riding but then it progressed to she wasn't riding anymore but she was still involved in the care of her horse grooming and feeding and all that and as she became more and more advanced they would you know, um, read books about horses or show pictures of horses. And I think by the time she was in the final stages of the illness, they were using a stuffed animal that was a horse uh, that was, she carried everywhere with her. But, you know, it sounds crazy, but you see how that theme of horses was kept throughout the entire trajectory of the disease. So, but in your care settings and at home, you can, um, a, a better example would probably be puzzles. So they like puzzles. Maybe they do the thousand piece one. You've got to kind of watch as they progress. If they're having difficulty with the big 
those puzzles you want to go to fewer pieces bigger pieces more visible easier etc so um and we just kind of do that in such a way that it's not completely obvious but um and it's hard sometimes because we see people every day and it's hard to really know when they're progressing, isn't it? It's kind of hard to tell when they're moving through the different stages. But if we don't adapt and simplify these activities, then what happens is they're not successful at the activity and therefore they become frustrated, agitated, maybe even angry. And so we want to right size things so that all of our activities are what we call failure free. And as we get into the later stages, we can even do um, activities that are more sensory in, nat in nature. So I was just saying that in the later stages, it's wise to use activities that appeal to all the senses. And research has actually shown that using this sensory type stimulation can be a really great tool and it can reduce the incidence of behavioral expressions and psychological symptoms. So um, as we see their verbal abilities decline over time, uh, folks can benefit greatly from different activities that are part that um, map to their senses. So let's talk about some of those. So tactile or touch, um, this first one is great. When we, we used to have an activity here called the R Gang Clubhouse, and we had folks in different stages of the disease who participated in that. And we had one woman who was very fidgety and agitated, and we asked what her, her daughter what she had done for a living, and she was a seamstress. So we brought in some different fabrics for her um, to cut and fold and just, you know, work with. And that was, she was very happy to be occupied in, in that. Um, sometimes you can do a game where you identify shapes by touch. Uh, you can give hand massages using um, scented lotion. That's really great. Uh, you can visit with animals, some kind of pet therapy, um, or you can sculpt or paint uh, using non-toxic materials. And I'm just thinking about something with this visiting with animals. Uh, we got a grant last year and we were able to buy um, some of the electronic pets. We had the puppies and we also had the cats. And I don't know if you're familiar with them, but you can order them online through the Alzheimer's store. And they're really great for late stages. And um, they the animals are very responsive. They move and purr, the cat purrs and meows and puts her paw up and the puppy barks and they're just adorable. And we had great success when we distributed to uh, them to individuals who were known to be having, you know, some behavioral expressions. So that's something that you might want to consider. Or even adopting a real pet, um, you know, they can be great fun and uh, soothe, be very soothing to your residents and or family members. You just have to be careful because they can become a trip hazard. Sight. Um, I had a big like scrapbook and I laminated pictures, just interesting pictures to use in the clubhouse. Um, pictures of old cars, pictures of different places around the world, um, animals, you know, scenic pictures, just things to inspire conversation, uh, reminiscing. Um, we also would watch videos of funny animals. Everybody loves animal videos. Uh, you can look at nature or travel. You can look at photos together. I mentioned that um, the person I cared for for so long looked at photos and loved them. Um, she, had, she had a box of photos that I would 
a light box. I would set it on her lap and she'd go through them. And toward the later stages of the disease, she stopped recognizing the people in the photos. And she thought the photos were mine. And she loved looking through them. She'd look through them every day and she'd say, oh, you've got your family's beautiful <laughs> and she enjoyed it and the, that's the main thing it's not the comprehension it's the enjoyment so um you might watch birds out the window get a bird feeder uh painting with watercolors that's uh reminds me of our memories in the making art program which has been very successful in engaging people through the years to paint pictures and messages from the past um, or go outside and enjoy the fresh air the vitamin c <laughs> uh, sit by an open or d it's d that we're looking for right in the sun sit by an open window together so engaging the sound well you know music it's number one it's it's just so effective for people in all stages of the illness. Um, so listening to familiar music, dancing together. Uh, we have a Connect to Culture program here at ALS OC, and we invite people living with dementia and their care partners out into the community to have dances to live entertainment and it's just so much fun to see them singing the old you know the classic songs from like the 60s and 70s now and um also you can listen to recordings the sound of nature uh, that can be fun for someone that maybe grew up on a farm you can listen to songs or speech in the person's native language. And you know, for many people with dementia, they will revert to a native language uh, later in the disease, their first language. And that's because of the problem with short-term versus long-term memory. So the, the native language is embedded in their long-term memory. They remember that. And as they're forgetting language in uh, the English language, they'll revert to um, their first language. And so uh, if you can, again, use music or read poetry or books, it's beautiful. I mean, even when people don't understand what you're saying, like reading out loud is a wonderful activity because they just enjoy the sound of your your voice. So, yeah. Smell. You can, I tried this a couple of times, the small plastic bags with the different scents. And it's a little bit, it, it, it worked out okay, but for some it can be a little too overwhelming. So I would suggest, you know, again, the fragrant lotion for the hand massages. And then just having a sweet smell in the environment. So I know that for many care communities, they have bread machines or they're baking cookies all the time. And you can, of course, do that at home. Um, and it just, as the smell, you know, goes through the house, it just smells so good. And it has a soothing effect on people living with dementia and for all of us, right? Um, I would bake with my lady and we did it was very simple I had to make it very simplified and so we just I ended up after a time just getting those tubes of dough and we'd cut them and lay them out on the pan and then have them bake and then smell that and eat the cookies together and it was it was always good with a cup of hot chocolate so oh apple pie and chicken soup that sounds good too all right, so try to think mind, body, and soul, you know, and things like music and singing, again, are number one, as far as I'm concerned, rhythm and movement is great, uh, whether it's dance or doing simple chair exercises together. I mentioned art, the Memories in the Making program. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Memories in the Making, I'll tell you a quick story about back when it began, which was back in the 80s, uh, believe it or not. Uh, there was a man who was in a day center and he was 
pretty impaired. He didn't have any like really have any language. He kept painting the same scene over and over again. And it was very simplistic, but it was always the same. It looked like a river. And then there was a tree that was, you know, sort of hanging over the river like a weeping willow. Uh, and because he kept painting this in a repetitious way, they asked his wife if that meant anything to her, that scene. And she said, yes, that's where we got married. That is the scene, the place on the riverbank under that tree is where they had gotten married so many years ago. And then it became a favorite place for them uh, throughout their marriage. They brought their kids there for picnics, anniversaries. And it was a very meaningful thing for this man who could no longer speak. It was a very powerful example of how nonverbal communication prevails in this disease. And it speaks directly to what I was saying in the beginning about how people don't lose the essence of who they are. And it's really hard for them to get these messages out, but it's incumbent upon us to find pathways for them beyond traditional language. And so, you know, these things come out with their, with music, um, with, with art. If people are, if you're, if they're a person of faith, you know, they may uh, remember hymns even when they can no longer speak. And we know that to be true because here at Al's OC, we have been doing interfaith services for people living with dementia for many, many years. And they're simple services and they're built upon really powerful symbols. It could be a cross, it could be a Star of David. Um, we have old, old hymns from you know years gone by and we see people who are no longer speak mouthing the words to these to these hymns so um you know that's what i mean by engaging mind body and soul we want to really get at who these people are light you know their life beyond dementia so um what else can we do? Cognitive activities. Um, I was just talking about this game earlier. We used to play a game in the clubhouse where I'd have a whiteboard and I'd say, all right, name all the things you find in a woman's purse, you know, and right away, you know, they'd start calling out things um, and women would start looking in their purse. And I'd have to say no cheating, but those kinds of games, um, you know, name all the things you find in the refrigerator. Uh, it can be really anything. And then those reminiscence activities. If you have a book with the pictures in it, um, you know, you can bring certain subjects to life or to light, I should say, that are very meaningful to the people that you're serving. Um, uh, exercise, spiritual activities, all of these things are important. You know, one of the things that I advise is that every person should have like a little box or basket of just simple go-to activities. Um, and I know that when I was caring for Mary in her basket, I had a number of things. But one thing that I just thought of when I saw reminiscence activities was a little spiral bound notebook that I found in a desk. And it turns out it was a record of she and her husband's trip around the United States in a Volkswagen van. And she kept this little diary, this travel log. And so I kept that in her basket because she would enjoy looking at that and talking about that. Um, and, you know, I put some maps in there. I put her wedding photos in there. Um, other just, you know, you, you plan it according to the person's preferences. And um, if they're a person of faith, it could be uh, religious writing, scripture, etc. So draw upon all of these things to really add quality of life. And that's what we're really about is adding quality of life to our person's days.
to our residents' days, to our loved ones' days. Yes. Also, and you saw this poll question already, <laughs> everything you do with the person, it is an activity, even personal care. So you might, might want to kind of look at things like bathing, grooming, eating. They're not just tasks that you have on a checklist, but they're opportunities to engage the person and have some meaningful time together. And I know, um, you know, for me, when I was caring for someone, I would make, um, and so many of you have heard me talk about this, instead of sh saying showering, you know, because shower is a bad word. People don't like that. I'd say, we're going to have a spa day today and uh, we're going to get you cleaned up. And then I'm going to give you a, a full body massage. Well, she was actually, you know, she was real happy to hear that. She forgot about the bath part. She just heard the last part. But I would turn that into, you know, a great activity because I would give her a massage and then um, I would do her hair and I would do her makeup and, um, you know, she'd get dressed and look very attractive. And then I'd usually shoot a little video to send to her kids or I'd take some pictures. So it wasn't just a shower, it was spa day. And I know when you're caring for multiple residents, that's not gonna be possible. But for individual, if you're giving individual care, it's a great activity. And even if you are caring for multiple uh, residents, you can consider something like a, a makeover day where you're going to do everybody's nails and you're going to do their makeup, et cetera. So, um, you know, eating uh, is can be social. You can have them engage with you, help with serving, help with the placemats, you know, set the table with nice, bright fiesta wear, maybe have um, candles, not the, the, what are those electric kinds called? I think they're LCD candles. I'm probably saying that wrong, but you know what I mean. The ones that switch on and off. So think about activities of daily living, not as chores to check off, but opportunities to engage. So in this final part of the uh, lecture today, I just want to give you some examples of different activities across the stages. And so I'll let you look these over. And remember, you're going to you have these slides, they were emailed to you. So, um, you know, just kind of I'm not going to read them all, but just kind of eyeball them. Um, yeah, early stage, lots of opportunities there. And then middle stage, you see more tactile things here, sorting, matching, puzzles, etc. But you see how some of these things go across the stages, right? You see music in all three stages. Um, yep, household duties. Oh, there you go. Those are tasks that involve repetition. So sweeping, dusting, um, that's great. You know, we used to always say the men can go out and rake the leaves or do yard work because they, they love to feel productive that way. Folding tea towels or folding clothes, you don't worry about whether they're perfect or not. Yeah. And then late stage, definitely, definitely more low key, more tactile. Yeah, you see that memory box? That's what I was referring to just a few minutes ago where you put the old family pictures and valued objects in there. Yeah therapeutic touch, pet therapy, etc. All right, just a couple of final considerations. And I think I've, you know, made these points rather, uh, I've tried to emphasize these points throughout the hour that we were spending together. One is to focus on the connection, not just the task at hand. And by the way, when you do have a task and you're attempting to make a connection and follow through on that, you know that if it's not going well, it's best to back off because in other lectures, you've heard the saying, if you don't insist, they can't resist. So keep that in mind. Um, 
But if you alter your approach the way we talked about today, sometimes you can be successful. And then you've got that great connection, which is what we're all about. And then finally, no matter how far people with, a, with dementia progress in the disease, they never, they never lose the desire to communicate and connect with others. And we can come to them no matter what stage they're in and provide that comfort and that quality of life. And here's one final picture from our photojournalist. And this was a woman on hospice and she had, uh, she loved dogs. And so as part of her um, hospice interdisciplinary team, they included a pet therapist and the pet therapist came by every day you know, in the, in the final weeks and gave her that opportunity to be with animals. And so it was wonderful. Okay, so that brings me to the end and I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren. Okay, thank you so much, Kim. Such a great topic and such useful information. So just a quick couple reminders before we get into the Q&A section. We want to remind everyone of the importance of being aware of implicit biases or unconscious stereotypes as we would care for others. A best practice is a person-centered approach, which we learned about today, where we view each person that we care for as an individual with unique needs and preferences and treat them with dignity and respect, even when they are very different from ourselves. If we always listen carefully and respectfully so that we understand their perspectives, values, and preferences, we can build trust and provide the highest quality of care. Now, if you have any questions for Kim, please be sure to type them in the chat box in the taskbar. We do have questions already for Kim, so please stay with us. But before we begin the Q&A session, if we do run past 1230, you are welcome to remain online to ask your questions or listen to the answers. But if you need to leave the webinar, you can. Just remember that if you want to earn CE credit, you need to be online for the full 60 minutes. And I also want to thank, take this time to thank our sponsors one more time for making this presentation possible. We're so grateful for the support from O'Connor Mortuary, Care Choices Hospice and Palliative Services, and Comparing Companions at Home. And also don't forget um, about our upcoming webinars that we have. On Wednesday, February 21st at 11 a.m., we will be hosting a webinar on uh, navigating assisted living and dementia care for your loved ones. We will not be offering CE credit for this webinar. And then on Tuesday, March 12th at 1130, we will be hosting our continuing education webinar on the topic of sexual expression in dementia. Okay, so now let's get to our questions for Kim. Uh, for our first one, how do you provide meaningful activities if the person is in a later stage of dementia and is unable to communicate their interests or hobbies and has no families? Okay, so I think this is where we were already talking about the um, sensory type activities um, that you know, appeal to smell or touch, etc. Uh, listen to soothing music, you know, that's usually a hit with anyone. Um, and when you say no family, I guess what you meant by that is they weren't able to provide any information. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Information. So you can experiment, you know, with, um, with music and mm -hmm. dance. Yeah. I mean, that's, I kind of start there. Okay. If I don't have much information about the person, I can usually find something like that. But I mean, I think mainly people just need something to do with their hands. Mm -hmm. You know, I, um, you, you think about these folks with dementia, they've had these big lives where they were productive all their lives. Most people worked, they were busy all the time. And then it just seems like now they have nothing to do. They're just sitting and they've got, they need things to do that are productive and they need mm -hmm. things to do with their hands. So anything like that, I think could be helpful. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> a trial and error, you know, if you try trial and error, and they if you... walk away, they don't like it. That's not it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But it is ever so much more helpful when you have that information from the families. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then someone asked about, oh, way to order electronic pets. Is there a specific right. website? Yes. The Alzheimer's store. And um, 
I'm just trying to remember. Oh gosh, I think I have some here. I think they're called Joy for All. <laughs> okay. I wish I had one I could demo for you now. I've there I've got one case that's sealed. I don't want to open it up right now. But anyway, yeah, Joy for All and they are expensive. Um, we we got a grant to cover them, but they are so popular. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, and then this was a an interesting comment. Is someone asked or someone stated the term? And it was speaking about person centered care. And for to go back to poll question number one, that person centered care, you must know something about the person's personal history. That the word must is a little too restricting. And can we use the word helpful instead? Absolutely. I agree. Okay. It would be helpful to know something about their background. Okay. Right. Um, and then someone's wondering about activities. Um, so I, we're getting a couple questions regarding specific people and specific circumstances, which um, our helpline will probably be the best case for those. We're getting some about nurses, people that are opinionated, some who can't be engaged in an activity due to a behavior of saying, help me, help me. So I encourage those, um, Kim, unless you have something to add. Yeah, I think we just need to get people doing something. Um, I was just remembering a man who um, was admitted to residential care and he was very agitated and he was banging around and push, you know, kind of banging up against the doorways, going in people's room, very agitated. And we found out what he did for a living and it was, he was a contractor, a general contractor. So believe it or not, just by putting a, clipboard in his hands that helped because his all of his pacing around turned into inspecting and so he was walking from room to room and like checking things off on this clipboard it was like a miracle but you know because he was used to being the head honcho he was very you know assertive he had been the head contractor all his life and so just just a simple device like a clipboard kind of gave him a purpose and made him feel, you know, it, he, he engaged in a different way as a result. So I'm not suggesting by any means that this is like easy. It's not. And you do, as you mentioned, Lauren, a lot of trial and error uh, to see what works best with people. But I just know, I'm convinced that um, activities are really the best way to prevent behavioral expressions from happening. And so again, the more you know, the better equipped you're going to be to, you know, kind of move in there and skillfully redirect people into this activity. So uh, distraction and redirection through the use of activities, I think is highly effective in controlling behaviors. Okay, great. Thank you. And again, mm -hmm. if you have a specific question, um, our helpline, which the information's on the page in front of you, has can definitely guide you in the right direction. Um, yeah, that way they can they can problem solve with you, and mm -hmm. in, in a and spend time with you in a way that I can't, you know, today. Okay, and then we just um, someone gave some feedback, a nice story. When I play oldies or hymns for my mom with end stage mixed dementia, her arms become less tense from their regular Parkinsonism state of tension and her facial uh, gestures become more calm. Um, the eye Absolutely. contact as you enter her room is important so you don't scare her. So right. again, just... And you don't want to walk up behind her. You want to approach her from the front so that you don't startle her. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, let's okay. see if we have any more questions coming in. I think as of right now, we're, we've answered all of them. Well, it's been a pleasure to be with all of you today. And um, I hope that if this was a refresher course for you, that it'll indeed inspire you, re-inspire you. Uh, and for those of you who are new, we're, we're glad to have you here. And uh, Lauren has talked about other webinars that are helpful. And they're all on our website at www.alzoc.org. And we hope to see you at a future uh, class as well or event. Okay, wonderful. Thank, thank you thank for you. having me.
Okay, are we signing off now? Oh, okay. Oh, wait, hold on real quick. Um, okay. <laughs> sorry, I was looking at another question. So thank you again so much, Kim. Of um, course. And just as a reminder, as you close out, we're going to have the survey link pop up. So please take that survey. Um, and watch for our flyers that will be coming out for our next webinars on February 21st and March 12th. And please feel free to pass it on if you think anybody else might be interested. And don't forget, you can visit our website, alls.org, to learn more about our education programs and webinars and to view recordings of past webinars for free, although no CE credit can be earned by viewing those recordings. So thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Bye-bye. Thank you.